what a joy today to be introducing our captain of industry, the remarkable and remarkably young Dr. Anne-Marie Imafedin, MBE. And as many of you know, the purpose of this series of talks is to hear from industry leaders who really are experts in their fields, people with the power to inspire our graduates and students and everyone who attends the talk. And Anne-Marie is certainly an outstanding speaker and captain of industry. But she's also a much valued honorary graduate and friend of our university. And these talks provide you with an opportunity to hear firsthand about our speaker's career journey, their lessons learned, some of the challenges along the way, uh, and about their thoughts on the future of their industry all very valuable and important insights. Anne-Marie is an internationally recognised thought leader and a keynote speaker, presenter, co-founder and CEO of the STEMETS, the award-winning social enterprise inspiring the next generation of women into STEM, that's science, technology, engineering and mathematics. STEMETS' vision is to create a more diverse and balanced science and tech community. And to date, this is this uh, STEMETS has worked with over 45,000 young people through events, workshops, and experiences. A child prodigy, certainly. Anne-Marie was the youngest girl ever to pass A-level computing at the age of just 11 and one of the youngest to be awarded a master's degree in mathematics and computer science by the University of Oxford at the age of just 20. That's no mean feat. These impressive achievements led to an outstanding career working for organisations such as Goldman Sachs, Hewlett Packard and Deutsche Bank. And in recognition of her accomplishments, Anne-Marie received an MBE in the Queen's Honours in 2017 for services to young women and STEM. And in 2020, she was voted the most influential woman in tech in the UK by Computer Weekly. But more importantly, she was awarded a Suffrage Science Award in 2020, which is a really prestigious award for leading women in life sciences and mathematics. And it's curated by the Medical Research Council, London Institute of Medical Scientists. It's of note that over a hundred years after women got the vote, only 24% of those individuals working in core science, technology, engineering and mathematics are women. Through her STEMETS initiative, her podcasts and leadership talks, I am absolutely certain that Anne-Marie will help change this statistic in a very positive direction. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Anne-Marie Mafton to deliver this afternoon's talk. Thank you very much, uh, President. Uh, yeah, lo loads there. So uh, I think you said most of it. I don't know if there's anything left uh, for me to say, uh, but thank you very much uh, everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, and thank you very much uh, to, to GCU uh, for having me. Um, and it's almost nice to, to be back. I think uh, Pamela hearing your voice, it feels like I'm back in Glasgow again, even though it's been so long since I've been there. Um, so this afternoon, I wanted to uh, share with you, I guess the, the kind of the view from a captain as I've been called um, today, um, but to speak to all of you as the alumni class um, of 2020 um, and before, but also staff and students about what it is and what we need to do in order to captain the STEM industry. Um, and this is something that uh, kind of you've put to me as a brief, but it's also something that's always on my mind, as you heard there from Pamela. I wear a lot of hats and do a lot of things um, and get to sit across the industry and see lots of lots of cool things that are happening, but also lots of things that need direction and need drive and uh, need to be better. And so I'm hoping to share some of that with you all today, as well as some uh, more practical tips 
on how to captain your own part of the STEM industry. So first things first, um, uh, you heard a little bit there from the president about uh, my upbringing and my background, but ultimately for me, uh, kind of this has all been about my curiosity um, and about the fact that I like helping people and solving problems. Um, so kind of there on the left hand side is with a bit of a cheeky face on her is, is me aged about four years old outside my parents' house in East London. Um, with the cheeky, with the cheeky expression, because I've probably just broken something or taken something apart. Um, I've always liked knowing why things work and how they work. And um, at that age, the best way to do that was to take things apart. So one of my earliest memories was me taking apart a VCR player at home, uh, which as the alumni, as the class of 2020, you may or may not know what a VCR is. I'm kind of trying to trying to look around to see there's a couple of nods there from some of you on, on remembering those. They were what we had before DVD players, which is what we had before Blu-ray players, anyone? Um, and so for me, I was always fascinated to know how did this black cuboid rectangular object go into another black cuboid rectangular object? And then Timon and Pumbaa showed up on the third big black rectangular object. Um, and so uh, taking things apart uh, was my introduction to STEM, was my way in, uh, and was where I learned to love the logic and understanding how things work and all the capabilities that we have across STEM. Uh, so that was how I ended up, uh, as you heard, kind of having this prodigious childhood and sitting exams early and going to study maths and computer science at a higher level. Um, and for me, STEM has always been the choice. It's always been the thing that I've been excited about. And for me, it is about, you know, understanding how and then applying that knowledge and solving things for others. So that was what I did working as a technologist uh, across industry um, and, and continue to do now through lots of things that I do. Uh, that pursuit, that curiosity um, and that wanting to help others, I guess, is still what drives me for a lot of the, the more random, non-necessarily traditional STEM things that I might end up doing or have ended up doing um, since. So whether it's having the podcast, whether it's meeting, um, this has been recorded, so I'm going to call her Queen Elizabeth. Normally I call her our Liz, but you, you, you didn't see that on the recording. Um, that is me actually at GCU there in the top right. So some of you might you might remember that day, President, uh, actually. Uh, a slightly different hair as well last time. Last time I was up there in, in the middle of town, whether it's on the red sofa, whether it's uh, kind of in interviews and in other places, it's still something that drives me, this kind of, we know that and that works that way, how do we then solve this problem and how do we then do better? And I think for any of you that are listening in that are yet to graduate or have graduated and are within this STEM field, I think that's still the thing that, that's, I, I know maybe it's something that drives you, but it's, it's definitely something that weighs on my mind all the time, that these things that we tinker with, these things that we play with, the things that we research, just out of curiosity, out of wanting to apply knowledge that we have, out of wanting to solve problems. You know, they're not purely about us tinkering and us playing in the lab. Um, I remember when I was at, at university, uh, my um, senior academic that kind of looked after us was in charge of robotics for, for the university and was actually in charge of the robotics football team for the country. And it's quite an interesting one to think that those are just things that we play with and we tinker with that actually end up having quite a big impact. So this is a, a screenshot from a McKinsey report a, a couple of years ago, but we can see down the left there things like mobile internet and the internet of things and cloud technology, which have all been things that we've tinkered with as technologists that have now ended up being released out into the real world and are having quite a big impact and we can see here on the right hand side a couple of years ago you know all of those are in the trillions apart from just there at the bottom autonomous vehicles but these are still things that are yet to happen these are still things that are coming um, and these are still things that we're we're working on and so for me being someone that works in stem means that ultimately we're creating the future we're using this knowledge we're applying all of it and we're making what happens next. Um, when you think about the future, I don't know what any of you imagine, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 20, or even you're one of these people that can kind of see a hundred years into the future. I don't know what you imagine when you think of that. Is it something like this, a kind of Guardians of the Galaxy-esque scene with silver buildings, something looks like a, a bit like the Burj Khalifa in the middle and kind of flying cars? 
Um, is it something that's more dystopian and more black mirror? Is it something that's a little bit more utopian? So when you think about what happens next, when you think about the future, what is it that comes to mind for you? Um, as someone that's working within STEM, of course, you're a big part of innovating and ensuring that we've got those flying cars or autonomous vehicles or whatever your, your area might be, or a vaccine uh, maybe, or whatever your, your area might be. But I think it's always a, it's always an interesting one, or it's always something for us to kind of keep in mind that the future isn't actually that far off, right? There's, there's so many things that we're working on now that are in their infancy that we might consider as innovative that mean that we're actually closer to that future than we might realize. You know, there's the, the great quote uh, from William Gibson, kind of the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Um, an example I always love to give is, is Knight Rider, which some of you may remember. As the class of 2020, you may not, uh, but this was a show from the 80s where there was someone uh, called Michael that would fight crime with, with his car. And he talked to his car um, and the car would understand what he was saying and they'd be able to kind of fly off to different places and, and do all these cool things. And it's quite funny to look back at, you know, even some of the things we see in science fiction or we might have seen in science fiction that, you know, talking to your car is actually a real thing that you can do now. Talking to inanimate objects is is very real. In fact, I'm almost afraid to say, you know, Alexa, can we get some toilet paper just in case some loo roll arrives at someone's house in the next couple of days and apologies if it does. But it's quite a quite an important one for us to kind of consider and to, to, to take on with us as we, uh, as we work as innovators and as we work in this field that everything we're doing um, is important, everything that we're doing matters and everything that we're doing has an impact on what happens next. Um, and we see this uh, in many of the headlines that we have that are kind of science or STEM related, whether it's powerful antibiotics being discovered uh, because of new machine learning technologies being applied to kind of old data sets and things that have happened, whether it's being able to kind of have uh, advances in fields that aren't even necessarily STEM related, if that's even a thing. Uh, like this is an example from uh, BLP, which is a big law firm who have ended up using um, technology to be able to trawl through historic land registry records to be able to kind of process that and use that for for current property examples i do love the law ones in particular because it's always the one that people feel is kind of quite far away from stem uh, this is another one that someone's built called do not pay that if you have ended up getting a parking ticket somewhere which i don't know some of us might remember what it was like to park let alone to to get a parking ticket uh, but you're able to answer a series of questions and it automatically um, does your appeal for you just just um, kind of within within the technology itself. Um, and there are so many different things, so many different innovations, so many different fields that we're innovating on now that are building that future, that we're adding together, that we're collaborating. And I know there's lots going on at GCU as well across the different departments of that cross-disciplinary approach to be able to you know, bring, whether it's Internet of Things, virtual reality, autonomous vehicles or robotics to the fore to drive us towards what that future is. So for me, this is something that I'm, I'm, that I'm super excited about. I almost feel lucky that my curiosity and my wanting to help people has, has brought me to this point where I'm able to, to shape the future. Um, but it's, it's quite a big responsibility and it's something that um, I ended up becoming or have ended up becoming a little bit obsessed with. So I'm actually involved with the Institute for the Future of Work. Um, and, I'm, and I wanted to kind of spotlight this a little bit um, just for folks to think about Kind of the future of work for yourselves and um, when we talk about the future there's flying cars and all the rest of it but if we narrow the scope a little bit and look at what work will be like next and how these technologies are impacting the workplace i think it's a really uh, it's something i've become obsessed with and it's be become really important for me to also make sure that we are captaining and we're steering ourselves in the right direction in something that's so fundamental and so important to everybody if you think about the workplace that you're going into or some of you may already work and think about the workplace that you're in you know a lot of these technologies they're not going to just stay outside and stay for you know for entertainment and stay for kind of the other parts of life they're seeping into the world of work they're seeping into the workplaces that we're going to be in that we're going to be entering into if you haven't started already or that you're already in and they're changing the way that we do things 
Um, and this is definitely something um, that I think, uh, you know, I've, I was asked to, to share a little bit on kind of the pandemic and how that's changing our industry. But it's definitely something that, you know, those of us that were looking at this before the pandemic hit, there were quite a lot of different trends, a lot of things that we would noticed or that we'd spotted that we kind of said, you know, in five years time, in 10 years time, that's going to be a thing that actually the, the pandemic has accelerated in quite a big way. And so it means that we we need really good steward, stewardship, we need really good captaining of the industry, and we need folks coming in to make sure that they're aware of, you know, the, the impacts that your innovations and the work that you're doing might have in the workplace and beyond, and to make sure that you've got the right kind of um, attitudes, the right kind of folks around the table, and the right considerations. Um, we actually, at the Future of Work, uh, have got an equality task force that I am part of, where we have looked at the impact of a lot of these technologies on equality. Um, and this is something that I, I normally end up speaking to lots of folks about around across the world in terms of how technology is, is impacting, um, you know, when we talk about work, that could be hiring decisions, that's the way we recruit, that's the way we manage folks at work. And thinking about actually, how is that going to make sure that we have an improved situation in terms of equality in the workplace rather than repeating some of the mistakes we've already got at the moment or making the situation worse. And so there's lots for folks to be to be thinking about in terms of, you know, when we have this technology, how do we use it responsibly? How do we use it to solve problems rather than creating problems? Um, and how do we use it in a way that's lawful now and adheres to the spirit of the law? Um, so I'll, I'll give one example before I kind of move on um, to a little bit more of a uh, specific example of what's been going on for us during the pandemic. Um, one example, uh, which is actually referenced in this machine learning um, case study is from a particular organization um, and these are these are kind of real ones. We we anonymize them to kind of protect to protect the organisations involved. Um, but one example is from uh, was from recruitment um, and from hiring. Um, so if I if I go into the hiring example, this was one where um, many of you will be familiar with uh, algorithms being used to kind of sift through CVs at the moment when people apply for for roles at really big companies. Um, this particular company had decided to use an algorithm to help them with selecting candidates. And so what they'd done is they'd looked at who they already had in their organization. They looked at kind of customer feedback and analyzed the data around that for kind of positive words or kind of anyone that, that they knew was a kind of a good achiever. What were the kind of words that customers used to describe them? They then asked the different folks within their organization whether they could have access to their social media profiles. And they kind of were able to then try and match up and say, someone that does well in our organization, this is what their social media profile looks like. Someone that doesn't do well in our organization, this is what their social media profile looks like. Um, sounds good, I guess. You kind of take what you already have and you try and map it forward onto candidates. Um, but something ended up happening, uh, which was that uh, the hiring decisions that were made by this algorithm then ended up only selecting white men for these positions that they were trying to hire for. And it's quite an interesting one. It's not something that would be immediately obvious with the use of the technology. Um, it's not something that they intended at all. But if we take a step back and have a look at kind of there's a couple of things that that might have gone amiss here or might have gone awry here. And it's something that we definitely need to be thinking about as folks that are innovators in kind of, we got, we've got to look around the edges because otherwise it does end up being magnified in, in the applications of what we're doing. So with this particular example, there was an issue with proportionality, which is that there was a particular type of person that had a very well populated social media profile. And there was a particular type of person who didn't. And so the more well filled in your social media profile was, the more likely you were to be kind of better represented in this algorithm. And so the more likely that someone like you was going to be selected, which wasn't the point of what they were doing, right? That wasn't what they set out to do. But then that had the knock on effect uh, of what we saw later on. And so it's going to be really important for us as technologists, uh, for us as, as folks in STEM, as innovators, to ensure that as we build now, uh, we build better and we don't kind of have those uh, unintended consequences, which you could have seen if you were kind of looking closely at the details. So we learn from our mistakes, but also we see it how we how we can do better. It turns out in that organization, they actually didn't have the right kind of diversity to start off with, with the folks that they had in the team. And so how are they going to be able to improve that, I guess, um, 
uh, with their with their technology. So we can go on that more if anyone has any questions in the Q&A, um, but to bring it a little bit closer to kind of surviving the pandemic and, and effectively uh, now thriving in the pandemic at Stemets, um, my day job is working with young people, young women, non-binary young people too, um, age five up to 25, um, to show them that the options, the options uh, that they've got across STEM to kind of build their STEM capital, which is like cultural capital, but for kind of STEM and, and technical and, and innovative things, um, and to open up opportunities um, for them as well to be able to access the industry and, and head into STEM. Um, and for us, uh, this is kind of a, a tile, we call it Stemets tile, kind of a cross section of the kinds of things that we get up to, whether it's um, are intersectional programs that are longer term, they're based around cohorts where young people have mentors, they get to um, gain certifications or they get to kind of be a part of a club. Uh, we also have our impactful events, which are like coding weekends or panel events or kind of shorter term things that folks can get involved with. Um, and then the third pillar of what we do is, is our inspirational content. So we have our own closed social network. We're all over all the social media platforms as well. And we have our own on-demand zine platform. So with Stemets, it's been a really interesting um, time for us, um, not only because we're used to all getting into rooms where it's free to get in, it's fun to be there, there's lots of food. So we've had to kind of rethink how do we transition that into kind of virtual delivery. Uh, but also the young people that we support have needed slightly different things in a time like this, whether it's been, you know, considerations around their, their well-being and their, their mental health, but also, um, you know, sometimes there's been physical lack in terms of devices and in terms of data, um, but also kind of motivation to kind of keep going when it looks like actually your 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 future looks toasted uh, or looks like it's, it's going up in smoke so it's been a really really interesting time for us um, and for me uh, in terms of being this kind of stem captain to try and stay um on top of what we're trying to do trying to kind of stick to our mission stick to our vision keep my team going keep the organization going but ensure that we've still got the same level of impact and we're still supporting folks because um, believe it or not, there will be a time after the pandemic. Um, so we have to be, be ready uh, and ready for them to go and be able to engage with the industry after them. So it's been a it's been a, almost a year now, I guess, to the fateful time. And it's been a really interesting and testing time in terms of trying to apply a lot of those STEM principles of um, problem solving, of, um, of learning, actually using technology to be able to kind of deliver um, impact and support young people and um, we've ended up um, growing even more than usual uh, year on year in terms of the number of folks we've been able to reach in terms of the programs that we're running and in terms of the scale of the impact that we've had so I wanted to kind of color this in a little bit I've got a quick video to show you of how things started at the very beginning so this was kind of the end of March middle of March um, last year um, for a couple of months, uh, this was our kind of initial um, knee-jerk reaction to there's a pandemic, what, what do we do? During the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, Stemet hosted 13 weeks of tutorials, role model sessions and a Stemet activity club across three platforms. More than 3,000 globally tuned in for STEM mode in. Who's going to be the first one in? Welcome in. I'll introduce who this person is down here. Geraldine. Sheila Scott. And look for Cross. We've got Safe Talk Science, Joe. Hi, Joe. Romet. Regina. Fantastic people like Lola. Bernice. You are a pilot, a mum, and you're also the founder of B Sweets Company. Yes. Today's theme is entrepreneurship. Python. Nanoscience. Arabic. Agile. Satellite. Musical engineering. So I work at the European Space Agency. Abbey Road Studios. GCHQ. Did somebody say just eat? <laughs> <laughs> well done to everybody that sent images in, everybody that did the show and tell, and to everybody that's still flying these paper planes at home. We're really proud of you for sticking in with Stem Mode in and joining us so consistently. Thank you. So that was our initial lockdown sessions um, 
uh, last year that we were able to work on with, um, with the Department for Transport, Transport actually, the Aviation Department, um, who we'd already kind of had the a 2020. plan. Oh, there we go. We already had a plan for what we were going to do and had to pivot really quickly. Um, and so I wanted to share with you all um, some of the lessons that have been learned throughout my career, uh, but also ones that have kind of come into sharp focus um, in the last year of kind of interesting times that we've had. So these have been good, good things to kind of hold on to or principles that have worked um, that I definitely always share with graduates and with folks that are starting out. These are things that I talk to, to our young people about, um, but they're also ones that kind of will stand you in good stead for whatever happens next. It is tough. It's been a really interesting time. Things have been very different and they've been difficult for a lot of people. And so these are all... Um, this is kind of my, my tips, I guess, for you all in, in becoming a captain and in, in captain, captaining not just the STEM industry, but captaining your own career and your own destiny and what happens next. So the first one is to have a growth mindset. And for this, um, this is one where uh, I always have this kind of the diagram down the bottom kind of the magic happens outside of your comfort zone. I think a lot of us are kind of looking for magic. A lot of us are already outside of our comfort zones. So it's not that not as far as you normally need to go, I guess, in order to kind of get the magic happening. But in terms of having a growth mindset, I think um, for, for where the, what this has meant or what this means is that growth mindset means that you're always going to get, you're always getting better. You always want to um, get better, whatever it is that you're that you're working, you're trying to develop. Which, as a as a person coming from STEM, I think it's definitely something that will stand you in good stead across your uh, your career. Um, what we do is constantly changing. There's always something new on the horizon. There's always new applications. There's always new overlaps with other places. And so, staying stagnant or being like, I've got that degree, I know everything there is to know about that sorted is not going to be helpful at all um, and you'll be proved wrong very quickly so having a growth mindset being in that um opening yourself up to being continuously learning and saying do you know what i'm not learning this to be an expert or i'm not learning this to be the best that there is i'm learning this so that i'm better than i was yesterday and better than i was last week and i know more than i knew last year um having a growth mindset has meant that you know, we've, we're running sessions during the lockdown, you know, you saw that video there of all the things that we that we were able to run across 13 weeks. There was so many so much uh, opportunity to learn from that we kind of have got better now at running things on lockdown we know our platforms better we're able to serve content better so there's always been the opportunity to say okay cool. Um, in fact, this was a call I had uh, earlier on today, you know, Easter break is coming up. What are we going to do next time to stretch ourselves? What are we going to offer now next time to make sure that we are taking the learnings from, from what we had last time, but that the experience is going to be even better for these young people? We're continuously wanting to tweak and have a growth mindset and learn more. Um, and so, you know, your learning doesn't stop with graduating. And I've definitely sort of said this lot kind of last time I was, I was on campus. You, you're going to keep going. You're going to keep learning. And even if you're not someone that's within STEM, you know, there's always going to be something new for you to learn. There's always going to be something new for you to appreciate. And you want to kind of take this on almost as like a literacy. So you're, you're not learning, like I said, to be an expert and you're not learning so you can, you know, keep hold to everything that you build with your new skills. But you're learning um, in order to understand what's happening better. And you're learning in order for you to be able to um, kind of communicate uh, communicate in this new landscape, communicate in this new world, communicate in that kind of futuristic setting that you might end up in. So having a growth mindset is a really, really good um, place to start and getting comfortable being uncomfortable with what's going on is also a fantastic thing to, to get into the habit of. Um, in the same vein, uh, the second piece of advice is to always kind of see it as, as a cycle, see yourself as going through cycles. Um, and I always refer to this lean startup um, kind of book by, by someone called Eric Reese from Silicon Valley. Um, he's got this whole book. For him, it's about, you know, building a startup. But I think it's quite interesting for us to think about ourselves as startups, especially as you're beginning with your career. You know, you're, the, everything is new to learn. Everything is new to be proven. Um, everything is to, be, is to be gained. There's still so much for you to learn, but actually seeing yourself as this startup allows you to kind of um, not be too dragged down, I guess, emotionally by what might be going on in your career. And, you know, if you make a mistake, not to feel like you yourself are a failure and to have it weigh too heavy on yourself. So you're able to kind of 
look at it as a as external to you because there's a whole load of in life outside of your career um definitely there's lots of things happening outside of your career and happiness that you can draw from from other places too um but in this lean startup there's, there's this concept of um working in iterations and build measure learn and, and working in experiments which again is something we can take from our kind of stem academic side of things right there's lots of experiments that you end up doing when you start your research when you start a project you know it's not really a good experiment if you know what the answer is going to be and so how do you look at your career in the same way where actually it's about a series of cycles there's a series of experiments that you do you kind of note down what happened in that experiment and then you go back again and you and you change things up um and for me and uh, especially in this year but in general it's meant that you you're never a failure and i know it's a funny thing to say with everything that you heard from the president there about all that i've done but you know, I've failed at things. There are things that have gone wrong. You know, I always say <laughs> I passed my driving test the second time round. Like I, I'm not perfect. Right. And so being able to see these experiments and learn from them uh, makes you stronger. But it also means that you're not afraid to then take decisions because you're always saying, OK, cool. Last time I did this here's what happened. I'm going to try this. I'm going to measure what happens. I'm going to learn from it. And you keep on going. Um, and so it means that you are experiment, you are able to experiment, you are able to kind of take decisions quickly, knowing that it's just part of this cycle. And so it means that you'll you'll never make a bad decision in your life because you're continuously kind of feeding into that loop and seeing things as a cycle. Um, you know, question I, I almost always get when I when I do talks like this, um, until I started saying this to kind of preempt it a little bit, is you know, what's the worst career mistake you've ever made? And I always say folk, to folks unless the career decision involves a fatality or death like there's, there's no there's no bad career decision you know if you if you end up dying then it might not be a career decision that you're making but actually otherwise the stakes are always lower there's always that opportunity to come back and bounce back and continue to experiment um the third one and this is this is one that's been particularly important again as well during the, the lockdown um, se season or during this, this time has been to find a, a comfortable way for you to be visible. Um, and there's a great book called Working Out Loud that um, I always reference on this point, but you know, when you're starting out, um, getting having good habits is a really good thing to do, especially when you're starting. So that then when you're kind of bigger and when you're have more influence or you're captaining more, you've got those habits that you had then that you're able to take with you. And one of the ones that I found to be most powerful is finding a comfortable way for you to be visible. Um, I was saying to, to the crew just before that I'm an, I'm an introvert. Um, it, it might not look like it, but, but I am. I like being at home. I actually, you know, there's a headline somewhere in a paper that says Amri wants to be a hermit when she grows up. It's, it's official. Um, but finding a comfortable way for you to be able to share your ideas, share what you're interested in, share what you're learning is a really important skill to have. Um, and, I, and I say it's a kind of it's your way to be visible. For some people, this would be using you know, Twitter, for some people, this will be using LinkedIn, for some people, this will be using Instagram, for others, it will be a blog, for others, it'll be, you know, research papers, like there's lots of different ways for you to kind of share your ideas and, and share what you're thinking about and what you're interested in. So finding and experimenting and finding something that works for you, I, for example, um, don't like writing long pieces of text or prose, it's just not my thing. Twitter is great because it's 140 characters. <laughs> or 200 something characters, 280 characters, and then it's done, bish bash bosh. And it means if someone's sending something to me, I also don't have to read a book. I just need to read something short. And so that's been my comfortable way of being visible. And so that's where I use the most to kind of connect with folks. If anyone wants to connect with me on another platform, they have to wait a little bit longer because I have to spend longer to read it. And I just don't go there as often. But finding your place that you're able to be visible, you're able to share those ideas, you're able to, to uh, make connections, you're able to share things that you're learning, share things that you want to try out, share your experience experiments and the results of your experiments is a really, really important um, skill to have, an important thing to develop. And I think especially in times like this, you know, you might not have been able to get to networking events. There's, there's lots of things you might not have been able to do. And so this is another way for you to make those connections with people, make meaningful connections with people and allow folks to find you. Um, and this is one I kind of have added internally and externally down the bottom, because it's also one for you to think about especially as you start your career, you'll have internal platforms that you're able to use, as well as your external platforms that you want to keep updated. And you want to do that internally. You know, that's how management get to see you. That's how other folks across your organization will get to see you. 
this is you know within academia within industry within entrepreneurship so being able to share ideas and find a way that's comfortable for you to share that is a really really good thing to know and a really really good habit to be able to develop maybe it's youtube you know there are lots of different options that we have um, now uh, at the moment to kind of share that um the next tip or the next thing is to bring your whole self to work and i think this is one that's become a little bit or come into a little bit more into focus during uh during the pandemic that we've been through um especially as um it used to be that folks would kind of come to work you'd shut the door and you'd leave everything that was happening at home at home and kind of you'd pretend to be someone else at work and then you'd kind of go back to home and, and dip into it um now of course during the pandemic it's been harder you can kind of see people's homes they can only blur it so much and actually there's been a merging of, of the two lives and so it means that um, it's become it's become even harder if you're wanting to kind of keep two bits separate or have that on that side and hide all of you know the, the things that you might have that are different about you it's become much much harder and it means it's a lot more energy for you to hide those things and that's energy you could be spending on innovating on creating on um, exploring on your curiosity um, but even more so within stem it's really important to be able to bring all the different elements of who you are as a person to the problems that you're trying to solve. Um, and this is one that's, that's super important, especially in the context of, you know, having women in STEM, having different types of folks actually being able to participate and engage with STEM beyond the stereotype that we might have. Um, and it's something that um, I always use these two images, um, Elle from Legally Blonde, I always include um, to create, if you haven't seen the film, spoiler alert, I guess it's been out for a while, so it's totally up to you if you've not seen it yet. Um, but, you know, she she's not the typical Harvard law student. And so she's kind of taken on almost as a joke and ends up doing really well in her term and being kind of top of class, top of the class, sorry. But she does that um, through her really in-depth knowledge of perms which is, it's funny, kind of looking back at the film, you wouldn't think that perms would help you with law, but of course that's what helps her solve the case at the end of, of term, you know, being, bringing something that she knows really well, she's able to kind of apply that and have that cross-disciplinary cross approach within herself. Um, next to, to Elle, we've got Mae Britt Moser, who is a Nobel Prize winner. Um, and for me, I love this image and love uh, having her as part of my slides, uh, partly because the dress that she has is the kind of synapses that were part of the discovery that she had. Um, but also that uh, for me, kind of she visually always kind of demonstrates the stat that you're much more likely to win a Nobel Prize if you've engaged with the arts as part of your upbringing, uh, a science Nobel Prize. So I'll say that one more time, you're much more likely to win a science Nobel Prize if you've engaged with the arts as part of your upbringing, which you wouldn't, sounds kind of counterintuitive, right? You'd think you'd need to be one of these people that was a child prodigy and did her GCSEs really early to be the best at science, whereas actually having those different elements, being able to bring those different disciplines together is what allows you to be truly innovative. And even more so if you're someone who's underrepresented in a particular space, then often your perspective, you know, the experiences that you've had being so different from the others that you've got with you, mean that there's a, that extra bit of value that you're able to bring into the space. Um, and so that's why I've got to encourage others to, to here as well. If you're someone that's not necessarily underrepresented within the space, then encourage others to be able to bring that difference in, be supportive, allow them to feel like they belong and work really hard to make sure you've got different types of folks and different perspectives in your research area, in your sphere of influence, you know, around you so that you can create and something even better for the future with all of those differences. I know we're running a bit short on time, so I'm gonna speed through these um, last couple, just two um, bits. Um, the penultimate uh, tip and advice um, from me to you as a captain, and also someone that works with lots of young folks and especially has done that during this time, um, is to ensure that you have a mentor. And I know that's great because that's the M in mint. Uh, but also that you have a sponsor and as you as you start to build your career and a mentor um, as 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 like one that you can get from from the GCO Mint program is someone that you ask to help you out, someone that you're able to bounce advice from advance advice or get advice from. Sorry, a mentor normally is someone that's been where you've been before. 
not many of them will have lived through a pandemic and tried to start a career, but they'll, they'll be close <laughs> in terms of the advice that they can give and the experiences that they've had. Um, but the second bit, and for me, it's like a holy trinity. So it's almost like a coach, a mentor, and a sponsor. Uh, a sponsor is someone that advocates for you when you're not in the room. A, a sponsor is someone who puts you forward for uh, opportunities that you might not necessarily um, have the agency to put yourself forward for. So as you're starting your career, it might not be the time that you have a sponsor, but it's a time for you to start thinking about what you can do to be visible to sponsors because where you can ask someone to be your mentor and you can sign up to a mentoring scheme you can't ask someone to be your sponsor you have to be visible you have to be someone that they might have seen a tweet from somewhere or seen a post on LinkedIn or seen something internally posted up um, and a sponsor I always have this image this is um, Eden from Toddlers and Tiaras um, is a real human being it's the same human being in all the pictures as well um, with all the eyelashes all the makeup all the hair extensions all the everything um, Eden is uh, she was a uh, beauty pageant queen I think she did so well that she started her career at seven and was done by uh, started her career at four and was done by seven with enough money to pay for college and it's really funny to think at four she didn't ask for someone to be her mentor she didn't join up join, um, sign up for GCU Mint at four but she had someone that was a sponsor someone who was like do you know what you look like the kind of person that would be a great beauty pageant queen here's what we're going to do we're going to you know these are the eyelashes you need to wear this is the way you need to walk you're going to win all of those you're going to be great that someone was her sponsor I'm not obviously suggesting that you find someone that will give you the hair eyelashes and the hair extensions and the rest of it but someone that's able to say do you know what you look like someone that should have a that should have that honorary doctorate from GCU, or you look like someone that should be in this research team, or you look like someone that should be in my organization mm -hmm. from what you've posted on LinkedIn, from what you've done here, from what you, you know, all those kinds of things. So it's gonna be really important for you as you build your career. Um, and maybe it's motivation for you in terms of being visible to make sure you've got the right folks around you because you can't do it on your own. Uh, which brings me to my final point. Um, you can't do it on your own. Uh, it's really, really important, you know, you've got your ready-made tribe in the GCO, GCU alumni crew, but find people that you're going to continue to learn with and you're going to continue to grow with as you start and as you and continue on this always be learning mantra, you know, lifelong learning. I know it's definitely one of the big, one of the big themes and one of the big tenets at GCU. And so finding your learning tribe and learning with others will enrich your STEM career experience or will enrich your STEM learning experience. Um, it will mean that you're not lonely, you don't feel unsupported in what you're doing, but it also means that you will be able to kind of go further, right? Because when we go together, we go further. And so it's quite important for you to kind of think about what are the opportunities, what are the networks, what are the communities that you can tap into where you might gain those opportunities, where you might get those jobs, where you might learn that insight, where you might be able to be visible again and connect with sponsors and connect with mentors. Um, and so I've got a couple of examples here of kind of places to learn to build a learning tribe it doesn't have to be physical it doesn't have to be at events it can be completely virtual especially now there's more of these cropping up so definitely find a learning tribe and learn with others um, and so that's from me to you my advice on captaining in the STEM industry that's wonderful thank you so much um, I think there was a lot of good ad advice um, there um, so, so thank you for that I will let the the principal touch on that when she wraps up at the the end but even as somebody that's been in their career for a while I think there was some really good advice in there for all of us um, so we are going to quickly move on to the questions and um, uh, just a reminder for all our audience um, if you do want to, to submit a question you can use the chat facility and and I will uh, I'll do my best to, to put the questions um, to today's speaker. Um, but if you would like to ask the question yourself, feel free to use the raise hand button, which if you hover over the participants um, button at the bottom of your screen, then uh, the list of participants will come up and then you'll see the raise hand button at the bottom. Um, so the first question that, that we have for you is how can women and girls get involved with STEMETs? 
Sure, great question. So um, for girls, so as long as the person is under, is 25 or under, um, then there are lots of different ways to access what we do. Um, the best place to have a look at is our social media. So we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, um, we've got our website as well. And the Stemet Zine is a fantastic place to get started. We're kind of picking up some advice and seeing what we're up to. Um, we've got the events, we've got the programs. You can just hover and watch the Instagram and kind of jump in when you're ready. Um, if you're a woman, so we're kind of taking that as not a young woman, but someone that's slightly older, then unfortunately you're not in our in our target audience. So if you're a woman that's in industry, you can definitely volunteer and join in. There are only 24 hours in the day and seven days in a week. So we've, we've had to choose an audience so we don't keel over uh, and focus on them. But if you're a woman wanting to get involved, or if you're anyone really in industry, women or otherwise, wanting to get involved and then again our website is the best place to head over to follow us on social media um, and join our newsletter would be the other the other thing I'd say to, to see where you can dip in but you know there's volunteering opportunities uh, you can mentor you can get involved in fundraising you can get involved in you know writing a letter to your teenage self there's, there's quite a lot of different things that folks are able to do um, to kind of help support and inspire the next generation that we're working with. Wonderful. Um, we were going to, to come to, to one of our um, attendees today to ask their own question, um, but I've, I've seen, I, I can't see them listed on, on the attendance list, so I am going to move on. But if Naveed is in, in the audience, and uh, if we could raise the hand, but maybe you, using a Zoom, a different Zoom um, username, and I, I just can't, I can't spot them. So I'm going to um, move on to, to another question. Um, uh, that, we, that we have from from uh, the, the audience that was, was pre-submitted. How do I start my kids off and see if they are even interested um, in, in the subject area? The, the, the ages of this particular person is three, six and nine. So if at that age, there's lots that you've got. There's quite a lot of toys out there on the market. There's quite a lot of programming as well that you've got online. Um, I think making it as practical as possible. So kind of um, parents STEM activities Again, kind of searching uh, on the internet, there is there's probably more than uh, you have time for before they before they grow old uh, to engage with them on. So I think toys is definitely a good thing. Um, and then the the other thing that you want to do is um, you've got books. That, like there's a there's a lot of resources out there. So if you if you want to get them engaged, I think it's something definitely to learn along with them as well, uh, to see how STEM applies to different things that they might be interested in. But yeah, you've got toys, you've got books, there's parents podcasts, there's, there's quite a lot out there actually um, for anyone. There's not one particular thing I'd suggest though, because everybody's different. And so some children like reading more than children that like playing with toys, more than, than the kind of kids who like watching things. So um, give it, Give it, give it all a go. They'll, they'll be just like feeding them. Some of them like certain foods, and some of them <laughs> don't. So, <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, moving back onto the kind of higher education scene, we have a, a question from Rahel um, who wants to to kind of ask on your views of the importance of higher education. How do they get the dream job? And to touch on your your experience of of uh, studying in Oxford School. Sure. So I think, um, so how do you get your dream job, I guess, was the, was the main question, right? I, I can't see it. So apologies. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so getting your dream job, I think it's, it's always a good one to understand what is it that makes you tick and what are you excited about? I think the joy of STEM is that there are so many options. Um, already there that actually again it's a bit like the, the parents question kind of there's a lot to kind of dig through there's a lot to kind of see and so having your own list of what makes me tick what makes me happy what are the problems that I want to solve what are the spaces that I like to be in what are the ways that I like to work so I think that's a really really important place to kind of start from and kind of know what your non-negotiables are first before you kind of go shopping I guess uh, the next thing is then to actually go shopping and, and fortunately for you all you're able to try before you buy through things like internships and work experience so reaching out to these organizations uh, going by organizations like ours to see if there's any partners that they've got that you can sign up and and try and literally try you know whether it's a summer break whether it's um just after you've graduated you know there are a lot of schemes and even now during the lockdown there are lots of organizations that have now found their feet and are starting to kind of bring in work experience we've got some uh with Vodafone at the moment like there's quite a lot of of opportunities that are still out there but you want to make sure that if it's going to be your dream job it's one that kind of fits with what you know drives you so don't just say i, I don't know 
that those people are paid loads of money. I want to try that. It's like, no, what, what do you care about? What do you uh, enjoy? What do you want to learn more about? Not even necessarily what are you good at? Is it is kind of where to start with your dream job? And then the final thing is to network, um, which is why it's, it's great what you've, got, you've put here together with Mint, uh, is to network and connect with those people. Um, again, being visible, having your own um, profiles that you've got on, on whatever platform it might be, where you're already putting out the information and the things that you're interested in and things that you're learning, makes it much easier for those folks to find you. Because uh, searching is, is something lots of employers do, actually, as they're looking at candidates. So make sure you've got the information out there. If you're interested in, you know, thermo, in fluid dynamics, thermo, fluid flow dynamics, or whatever it might be that you're interested in, make sure it's out there. You know, people can't read your mind. So make sure you've got that there posted up. Make sure you've got that shared. Make sure you've got that documented. So then when you are applying, when you are trying to connect, then you've got a network. You kind of already know that that's something you're interested in. That's something that you've been able to show you've got a passion for. Um, and so I think I think that's the kind of the, the, the way to find your dream job the other thing I'd say though is that your dream job will change as time goes on and so always be open to kind of what's the next dream job or what's the real dream uh because the more you delve into this the more you'll realize oh my goodness I didn't realize biology and art was a thing that people did that's very me <laughs> and then before you know it you've kind of jumped across again so I think always be open be open to those opportunities and STEM is great where there's always something new out and so if you've got that list you can then check and be like okay cool is this on the dream job list or is it not before you, you give it a go? Okay, um, next we've got a question from Greg and he asks, um, what advice would you give to your teenage self? Oh my goodness, take yourself <laughs> more seriously, Amory. I never take myself seriously. I still don't, it's not just teenage self, it's my current self. I don't take myself seriously enough. I really should sometimes. <laughs> um, but for anyone else, I think uh, the advice I give to the teenage selves of the other young folks that we work with um, is, is actually from Grace Hopper, who was a Navy Admiral. Um, and she came up with the idea for the, the coding language COBOL and is also attributed wrongly or rightly um, with the coining the term bug. Um, so Grace Hopper said, it's better to seek forgiveness than it is to seek permission. Um, and what this is, uh, what this kind of for me is, or for teenagers, I think is that it can feel a little bit like everything is predefined and there's a right answer for things and a wrong answer for things. And I think, especially if you're a mathematician like me, you can get caught up in the, there's a right answer or a wrong answer, whereas actually life isn't like that. And so actually it's better for you to kind of do your research, have a look and get going and try things out and then ask for forgiveness if it's the wrong thing, rather than being like, hey, I wanna put bio and art, biology and art together. Is that, is that okay? Because then more likely people are gonna say no to you and tell you it's not possible. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just do one more question. Um, oh, I think there is another one. Is there another one just come in there? Um, from Maggie. Uh, has that come in? Oh. It's, don't be afraid to change direction, try different things. I found my yeah. job when I was 42, so. <laughs> exactly, it, it's always, like, there's no, I think this is the thing, right? There's no like stages or ladder or, you know, everyone's version of success is different. Um, and so always be open. And, and like I keep saying, you know, STEM is continuously changing. So it's possible when you were 20, that, that job that you saw it when uh, at 42 didn't exist. So, you know. Wonderful. Okay, as we're drawing to, to the end of the event, I am going to um, hand over back to the, the principal just to, to close today's event off. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think I'm on. Yes. Well, Anne-Marie, my goodness, you are so wise. I definitely want to be in your learning tribe. I know I'm too blooming old, but who wouldn't want to be in your learning tribe? What did I love about your talk today? So many things. First of all, your energy is compelling. You know, that human energy that just radiates from you. You're definitely a radiator uh, in life. But I also loved your ideas about the fundamental value of curiosity, the need for visibility of yourself and your ideas, being brave about bringing your ideas forward. Um, just loved your comments about the arts and STEM excellence not being mutually exclusive. Of course they're not. But so few people actually talk about that. Um, the need for sponsors and how sponsors are very different to 
you know, mentors. I think that's a point you don't hear very often. You hear it in the United States of America, but we kind of shrink away from thinking that we might need sponsors here in the UK. You were all really clear, I really love this bit, that we'll create the future through technology. I wanted to ask you, do you think, however, that technology will help us protect diversity, biodiversity that's going to be so traduced through climate change? It's just something for you to take away and maybe think about. But who knows, you know, if that might be a possibility. Our rainforests are being are disappearing, but can technology overcome that? Um, but I think uh, for me, all of the tips, when you put all of your tips together, one thing I think you'll help us all with is that imposter syndrome that so many women of all ages, you know, I had it until I was in my early 40s. You know, so many women of all ages have that imposter syndrome and you will really help us overcome that, especially in the STEM arena. So thank you very much. I just thought it was a thrilling talk this afternoon. I loved it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much.